morning and welcome to the latest mortgage changes with David Luna webinar. Please let me introduce the president of camp, Ms. Audrey Voicenow. Audrey? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to Dave, Luna, Megan Jackson, and Kevin Casey for helping us put all of these events together every week and sometimes three times a week like this week. Um, Dave, Luna, to put it mildly, you are just an absolute gem and we so, so, so appreciate that you are keeping us up to date with all that's going on in the mortgage industry and all these changes that keep coming at us. Just a couple of moments to talk about what's coming next for us on Friday at 11 a.m. We will have Ginger Bell, who is going to be doing a webinar on creating your virtual marketing survival plan. I had to practice that. That's a tough, tough title, but it's a good one. She's going to go into how to use virtual meetings, how to create and leverage videos, how to set up webinars, and how to create a plan to market through the next few months as we grasp how we'll be doing business. Um, next week on Tuesday, guess who's going to join us? Dave Luna at 11 o'clock. So this is a regular thing right now. And we, again, couldn't, we just couldn't do it without you. And then we tentatively have Barry Habib scheduled for April 24th. So stand by, guys. We keep, anytime an idea comes to us, we put it together as fast as we can. So if you have something that you'd like to hear about, or have a presentation on let me know, let us know, and we will make it happen. Um, also, just a reminder that it is definitely renewal time for camp. I would ask that you go to thecampsite.org, T-H-E-C-A-M-P-S-I-T-E.org, and either renew your membership or be a member. Just be a part of our community as we put these things together. We're volunteers, and we count on our membership to help support us. So. With no further ado, I would like to pass it to you, Dave. Enlighten us. What is going on in the mortgage world? It, it, it's like changes are happening every day. So let's do just a little bit of history. Um, if you go back to March 18th to March 24th and you see what was happening with rates and where you are right now, it's guys, it's not bad. So it started about three weeks ago with 3.3 million filing for unemployment. Two weeks ago, 6.6. .6. For the week ending, 4320, it hit a stunning another 6.6. .6. Unemployment has now risen to almost 17 million in just three weeks. And what was really, really sad is I saw that farmers are now plowing their fields that are full of food. They're just plowing them under because they can't sell it to cruise ships and restaurants. It's bad out there. It's serious. We're all at home or we should be. Um, so I promise, I promise. Uh, I will end it on a very, very positive note. So we'll have uh, you know multiple things that are positive. Uh, there are programs that are uh, meant to help those who can't make their payments right now, uh, but it's not really meant to help everyone, which is disappointing. So let's talk about what is on everybody's mind right now. The FHFA director started a firestorm with his comments. He is saying that delinquency of GSE mortgages, those Fannie and Freddie loans, are only gonna be about 3.6 by May, so next month. Jenny, however, allows lenders to use their loans as an asset to keep those lenders liquid or able to uh, meet their obligations with cash. Kind of works, it works kind of like a HELOC, using mortgages as the asset and then getting money used against it. They're all participant memorandum there. APM came out Friday, April 10th, after five o'clock. So one, it was Good Friday, nobody was working, the financial markets were closed. I'm wondering, well, why did you send it out there? But it stated, in response to the national emergency declared by the president on March 13th, in connection with COVID-19 or C-19, Jenny May has revised and expanded the issuer assistance programs in uh, their uh, mortgage-backed securities guide. It's specifically in chapter 34 for you overachievers that really, really, really want to look it up, including the pass-through assistance program. In our industry, we don't say pass-through assistance program, we'll just call it PTAP. Issuers may request PTAP assistance only once a month to cover their shortfalls on P&I. Stop. Remember, if the borrowers are on a forbearance, the servicers still have to make their payments, and if they can't make it to the, in to the uh, investors, then Jenny May is throwing them a lifeline that says, guys, we will help cover those shortfalls. 
They're going to have an interest rate. It'll be posted on Jenny Mead's website. And, it, and if you, again, overachievers, if you guys really want to know, it's the second business day of every month. And as I mentioned last week, it'll have a fixed interest rate in term for repayment. It's only going to cover P&I, not fire insurance and taxes. So PTAP requires payment in full. So whoever uses this line has to pay it back within seven months or at the very, 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 very latest is July 31st, 2021. Now, the reason I said that FHFA Director Calabria created a firestorm over Fannie and Freddie, their regulator, he is a regulator of Fannie and Freddie, he announced that it would not allow liquidity for conventional loans like Jenny has, like we just won't know what went over. Now, this is huge if it's left unchanged. What it means is he's sitting there saying, smaller companies, if you're a smaller servicer and you can't handle it, well, we'll just take the servicing from you and give it over to a larger lender. Now think about that for just a second. You have this person in DC that's gonna come into your company and say, well, you know, seeing that you have problems, we're just gonna take it from you and give it to your competitor. I have a problem with that. I have a real, real big problem with that. So there was a letter sent to the director stating, quote, the FHFA's director's recent comments sent a troubling message to borrowers, lenders, and the mortgage market. The director's unwillingness to offer support, okay, from Fannie and Freddie for the very firms he and Congress asked to execute his agency's forbearance plan. Remember, he asked for this. Only reinforces why the Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury must create a financing program to help residential uh, mortgage servicers who will have to provide unprecedented levels of mortgage payment forbearance. So I'm just giving you a little bit of an insight. It looks like things that are happening in, in, in DC, it looks like there will be a solution for Fannie and Freddie, though it's not on the horizon today. And I'll give you little, little views of what the heck is going on. And all of this is different from what we talked about last week. Also, I want you guys to be aware that there is no forbearance programs for jumbo loans. When we're talking about Fannie and Freddie, we're not talking about jumbo. When we're talking about FHA, VA, and USDA, we're not, we're not talking about jumbo. So you could still have a jumbo borrower lose their job. And that's why these programs are tightening up on their underwriting guidelines. They want to make sure that if they're going to do a jumbo loan, and there are a few jumbo lenders out there, that that loan isn't immediately gonna go into forbearance. Now, last week we talked about the differences between forbearance and deferrals. From the CFPB, they're encouraging borrowers to ask more and specific questions. I'm gonna cover that in just a second. On Wednesday, the day after we did our presentation at 1 p.m. Pacific, the CFPB came out with another video regarding the CARES Act, that $2.2 trillion that came out. Okay, they said that, that uh, borrowers who are wondering what their situation is like, they should ask their servicer. And the CFPB actually told um, consumers what they should ask their servicer. Here are the three questions. Number one, will the borrower owe the entire amount of missed payments in one lump sum, or will it be tacked on to the end of the loan? Number two, can the loan be extended so the payments are added to the end of the mortgage. Number three, can the borrower make larger than normal payments for a period of time in order to make up for the deferred amounts? I think the CFPB is really trying to help consumers have an intelligent conversation with their, uh, with whoever it is that they're making their payments to, whether it's the lender or servicer or both. Now we're gonna get a little bit, um, not political, but it's gonna get a little bit more firestormy. Ready? So I wanted to share a quote from Chris Whalen. And if you listened to um, Barry Habib yesterday, uh, he mentioned Chris Whalen. Now, if you don't know who he is, Richard Christopher Whalen, or Chris, is an investment banker and writer who lives in New York. He's the chairman of Whalen Global Advisors, LLC, and focuses on banking, mortgage finance, and fintech centers, uh, sectors. He's a very, very, very smart guy. Christopher is the author of several books and is a contributing editor to National Mortgage News. He wrote on April 5th, 
quote, listen to this, President Donald Trump needs to remove Director Calabria from his position at the FHFA forthwith and direct the Treasury to take over control of the GSEs. We must get Fannie and Freddie into the fight to save the conventional mortgage market and the U.S. financial system from a serious and unnecessary crisis. On April 8th, National Real Estate Post, Northern Cal, is a GSE bailout on, on the way? I'm, I'm going to tell you first, this is the first you've ever heard it nationwide. There will be a lifeline extended to the GSEs, probably not in the way that you guys are thinking, and it, it it's going to happen, but I can't tell you all the details. I've been able to visit with some who are working on this problem right now. There will be a solution. Um, I think we just need to be patient because sometimes it takes a while to, to move through the process. It's not a done deal, but based on information at the highest levels, it is in the works. As an example, I want to show you, I want to talk to you about some things going on. So there was a recent letter to the FSOC. If you guys are scratching your heads right now saying, Dave, what is the FSOC and what does it do? The FSOC is the Financial Stability Oversight Council. One more time, the Financial Stability Oversight Council. It has a mandate that creates accountability for identifying risks and responding to emergency threats to financial stability. Would everybody vote that we are in one of those threats right now? Answers yes. So the FSOC is made up of 15 members, five non-voting, 10 voting, and these are heavyweights. I mean, these are the decision makers in America. All right, ready? Here's the top, here's the top nine. The Secretary of the Treasury, Treasury um, Secretary Mnuchin, he's the chairperson of the council. The chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, Comptroller of the Currency, the director of the CFPB, the chairman of the SEC, the chairperson of FDIC, chairperson of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, the director of FHFA, the chairman of NCUA. I mean, that, that's the top nine right there. Okay, so to the FSOC on April 8th, we saw senators write to the Financial Stability Oversight Council to take urgent and immediate action to avoid this impending crisis in the housing finance system, specifically Fannie and Freddie. So in a letter to Secretary Mnuchin, again, the chairperson of the FSOC, the letter said, many servicers face an impending cash crunch as more and more Americans affected by the COVID-19 crisis are forced to seek economic assistance on their mortgages due to the economic damage and job loss caused by the health crisis. So I wanna take ev uh, excerpts uh, from the letter to the FSOC, ready? Quote, given the magnitude of the economic stress that many Americans will face as a result of the virus and the early numbers we are seeing from lenders across the country, it is likely that many families will be unable to make their payments as scheduled. Given that we could see as much as $100 billion in mortgage payments foreborne through this program, it presents an existential threat to these companies and thus to the broader mortgage market. At some point in the not too distant future, the strain on these non-bank mortgage servicers will become too much for many institutions to bear. And we fear that the repercussions of their failure to homeowners and the market will be severe. The reasons for acting are systemic. First, as weaker non-bank mortgage servicers begin to struggle, they may be forced to unload their mortgage servicing rights to stay afloat. This will drive down the value of MSRs generally, reducing the value of the assets for all other non-bank lenders. The CARES Act includes an appropriation of $455 billion for purposes of economic stabilization activities. Congress made these resources available, notice they're going to go around FHFA, to the Federal Reserve 
in order to address the types of liquidity challenges we expect mortgage servicers to encounter in the coming days and weeks. Thus, action in accordance with, um, and then they talked about a, a portion of the bill, section 4003, in accordance with that section, it would be entirely appropriate to use that money under these circumstances. So listen how they wrap it up. Moreover, we also believe that the FHFA and GSEs should ensure their policies mitigate, not increase the liquidity demands facing servicers consistent with the GSEs mandate to serve all markets at all times, end quote. People, those senators get it. And they're putting pressure on FSOC, especially the secretary, and you got the Federal Reserve there as well. Hey, if FHFA doesn't want to get this thing done, go around them. Have it come directly from the Federal Reserve. So I like it. Housing Wire yesterday, yesterday had 20 Republican members of the House send a letter to the Department of Treasury urging Secretary Mnuchin to create a liquidity facility for servicers. Obviously, this would be for Fannie and Freddie because Jenny already has a solution. I want to stop with that for just a second and give you an update. I'm going to tie it to other states and then tie it back into California. Since April 1, six more states have moved forward on remote online notarization. Uh, on April 1st, West Virginia. April 1st, Georgia. April 6th, Hawaii. April 6th, New Mexico. April 6th, Indiana. April 8th, Rhode Island. So the question is, where do we stand in California? So, quote, the California Secretary of State reports that notaries in California are permitted to perform notarizations and will not be penalized for doing so during the current COVID-19 shelter-in-place order, as long as there are no restrictions from individual county health officers and you follow federal, state, and local guidelines to protect public health and obviously protect themselves as well. Now, while remote online notarizations are currently not prohibited in California, and I really, really, really don't understand that, but just listen, the Secretary of State stated, quote, listen, California citizens who wish to have their documents notarized remotely can obtain uh, those servicers in another state that currently provides remote online notarization. Then they quoted California Civil Code 1189B. It provides that any certificate of acknowledgement taken in another state shall be sufficient in this state, California, if it is taken in accordance with the law of the place where the acknowledgement was made. If you're accepting them from other states, why can't we get them done here? So it's not my place. I'm going to move on. So let's update you on something else that happened in the last uh, few weeks. Wow. I mean, it's like new every day. So during a press conference after our last week's uh, visit on Wednesday, April 8th, officials from HUD outlined the actions taken by Jenny and FHA in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. So a few important details that came to light and a little bit of good news that said, documents for a server facility, listen, will be available at the end of this week, which happened on Good Friday, and borrowers will not be required to repay a lump sum after forbearance, end quote. I think that was huge. Uh, House Financial Services Committee, led by Chairwoman Maxine Waters, released a document with answers to FAQs. So some of you guys asked me questions on mortgage, credit reports, things like that. I, I dug a little deeper and I, and I have more answers for you. So from Chairwoman Maxine Waters, question. How will my non-payments of credit cards or bills affect my credit report and score? Here's the answer. If you're approved for a forbearance, a payment delay, or other payment arrangement with your creditor or servicer, and you are current on your accounts, then the creditor or servicer will continue to report you to the credit rating agencies as current or up to date. Now, I told you last week from the CFPB that they cannot mark you as late. What I want you to remember, however, is that lenders can also look at payment history. And even though you have a good credit score, they will see that no payments were made 
and it will be harder for that borrower to get a loan in the future. Lenders are telling me they will not do a loan for a forbearance borrower. Whether it's a purchase or a refi, they will not do it. Oh, but Dave, my credit score is 700, which seems to be the new norm. Doesn't matter. If they're looking at any in the payment history, the payments were not made, it doesn't matter. I'm also seeing that FICO scores being required to be at 700, LTVs are tightening, and temporary workarounds are being put into place for appraisals, VBOEs, 4506s, and stuff. Now, as I promised you, good news. Here's some really, really, really good news. Interest rates have generally been moving down in the last two weeks. Don't take the last two days as an example, but really in the last two weeks they've been coming down. The Federal Reserve announced on April 9th that they are getting another 2.3 trillion of financing into the economy. Speaking about money, the first checks have already been deposited by the IRS in your accounts. The first Corona virus stimulus checks have gone out and depending on when the last time you filed your taxes the irs is using that address or deposit information to get the checks out to you more good news the s p if we look at last week remember it's a short week gained 1.5 percent to close at 2789.82 that means it's been up nasdaq up dow up so s p Dow Jones, NASDAQ, they are all up. For the la for last week, the S&P surged 12.1%. That's the biggest one week gain since 74. NASDAQ had its best week since 2009, and the Dow soared more than 12% for one of its biggest weekly gains on record. Surprising news that I'm going to share with you guys now. Get closer to the get closer so you can hear this. Don't be surprised if you see non-QM start to come back next week. I've had conversations that are indicating that some will come back as soon as next week, but it's going to be with much more conservative overlays. More good news. Whether it's real or not, I don't know. President Trump said, April 30th as a deadline for reopening the US economy. Yes, there's pushback from medical people of, well, if we release you know, everybody from home confinement, we could start this virus again. We're gonna have to stay tuned on that one. That's why we're gonna get together next week. Um, it's gonna be a very, very weak second quarter. Again, people, recession, we're inside. I've been asked, when will we be getting back to normal? Repeatedly, I've told uh, industry it's going to be by mid-summer. I don't think we will really, really be back to normal without a cure. We don't have a cure to the coronavirus. How can we return to a normal lifestyle? So unemployment will go back to a new normal to take time. Everyone won't immediately be rehired, but service and hospitality might see a quick rehire but there's other sectors of the economy that it's going to take longer so if that's the second quarter we should see a great third and fourth quarter with rates being some of the lowest in history borrowers have a ton of equity pipelines are full i see it only continuing into the future and with that i'm sure we have been accumulating questions so i want to go back to our president and say uh, Madam President, do we have questions from the group? I know we've maxed this thing out with more than 500. I have no idea what the number is, but I know we've maxed it out. Uh, do we have questions that uh, people want me to address? We do, Dave Luna. Thanks. And yes, we have maxed out. And so we'll look at that. It's the first time that's happened. We have a lot of people who register, like the people who register but not everyone shows up and today we had an even larger number of people who registered and um yeah many people who showed up so good job dave luna thank you for being the little beacon of light for all of us so here we go and just i didn't mention it to begin with but if you do have questions put them in the chat bar and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can 
So I think you are not, I think you already answered this. Dave, do you think the homeowners who take advantage of the deferral program will be able to refinance without penalties once this madness is over? And the answer is a resounding no. no. So um, I know that we are all trying to get that message out. I see it all over Facebook. I see it all over um, LinkedIn, but we have to be communicating with our borrowers individually. So please call people. They really aren't getting the real information they need from their servicers, probably because A, services are overwhelmed, and B, a lot of them don't even know themselves. They don't know what their policies will be. They're still formulating them. So, right? True. True. Um, True. Okay. So, um, okay, this is a good one because this is, um, it, and, I, and I would love to you to explain the disconnect because, um, so let me start with a question. Any insight available on when pricing for high balance conforming loans will get back to normal range, it's crazy expensive. And that is a massive understatement. So what I would love for you to explain, if you could, is, so you have a Fannie loan, right? So I understand demand. I understand if nobody has an appetite it, type for it. That's one thing. But you, it, this is still a conforming loan, right? Um, it might be high balance conforming, but still conforming. How is it different and why is the pricing different? Go, Dave Luna. Go. Right. Tell everyone. So it's going to be a little bit technical. I really will try and convert it into English. Okay. So you have a product that you have no idea what it is worth. In the past, we were kind of watching, you know, treasuries and other securities and we, and we could get an idea for what it was worth. That is not our world over the last three weeks. It's just, it's just not. So if a lender makes a, a jumbo loan and they're not holding it on their line, they're trying to sell it what is it worth and so someone says okay you know uh, this is what we lend it out at and we'll just say that it's a hundred percent and i'm not talking about ltv and not talking about interest rate we're just giving it a value of a hundred percent and so someone says well i'll give you 90 and then you know well i'll give you 80 well i'll give you 75 and you're thinking no 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 no, no. it's worth 100 yeah no, no no it's worth what someone will pay for it and right now Companies are not buying them because one, there is no security that says I'm going to be able to get it off my line like there is currently with Jenny type loans. And so, you know, when they're priced like in outer space, I'm seeing interest rates of 10% on jumbo <laughs> loans. It's like, well, I don't know what I'm going to get on the back end when I sell it off. So, you know what? I'm going to price it when I get it on the front end when I make the loan in the first place. And hopefully I've priced in enough of a margin that I will be okay when I sell it. Solutions. We have to get the loans that are currently in the pipeline with 60-day locks off. Once that those have all moved off the, off the system, and we can bring back Fannie and Freddie into you know, this environment, and we can have lenders that say, okay, I can offload it because I have liquidity. It won't be until then that you're going to start to see these numbers kind of stabilize out. So guys, it's not going to be this week. It's not going to be next week. It's we're, we're still uh, going to live with the ridiculousness for a little while. And guys, that's why I'm calling it. Whether you're Southern California or whether you're Bay Area, Northern California, I, I feel you. I hear you. I understand what you're saying, but uh, it's still going to be a while. And I don't but mean that. I don't mean months. I mean weeks. But it'll still be a while. Right. But you were talking about jumbo loans and conforming right. high balance is technically Fannie and Freddie. And I right. understand that they always had to be a percentage of the pool, et cetera. But explain why that is so different than baby conforming or whatever we want to call it, regular conforming. <laughs> um, so conforming and high balance. So think of the answer still the same. It is an app. Okay. So you are making uh, blue fidget spinners right and it costs you a dollar but nobody wants to pay a dollar for blue fidget spinners so you're going to say okay what do people want well they want red ones okay let's make red ones because everybody buys those and i know they're priced at a dollar and i sell them at a dollar and i'm making money off of it so that's what's going on with mortgages today so if it isn't Got something it. anybody has a, an appetite for or a huge line of credit that they can just portfolio and keep them yeah it's going to be priced ugly and that's a technical got it it's going to be priced ugly got it so um 
Somebody's asking about needing a notary in Italy. He has health. Somebody has health issues and have a, hasn't been able to go to a consulate. I suppose the answer is you find a lender who will use a remote notary, right? From is Italy. It? Good luck to you. But no, no, no. As we were mentioning those other states that are close to mm -hmm. or around us. Uh, then that's going to be more likely to do something with a notary in Italy. Eh, I don't know. Italy's quite not the same as, say, Hawaii, you know, next door to the West or, you know, some other states close by. So that's, I, it was meant to be U.S. because our rules are different from other countries. That's for sure. Okay, um, so this is a really important question and make sure you think very long and hard about your answer. How do you look so young, Dave Luna? <laughs> I, I married okay, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I married well. Uh, there, there, there's my answer. That's well. very, very I, true. I don't, and very, I don't very true. A lot of uh, stress on the home front. So really, all I have to do is concentrate on taking care of very, very cool people. And again, thank you for all the well wishes for my daughter. She is doing uh, well. She is done with her chemo treatments. We start into uh, radiation, and uh, we're super, super grateful that the shelter in place and Everybody has to stay at home because um, it's cutting it's cutting down on potential people that she could be in contact with. She has no immune system. And just all the well wishes from all of you guys, you guys are super, super cool. And as a dad talking about his baby girl, I, I, I appreciate all of you guys, thanks. Everybody loves you and wishes nothing but the best for you and your family. Okay, so we have a question about um, construction loans and them pulling out or pulling back. What do you see construction loan access going to in the next two to three months? In two or three months? Yeah, I, I think yeah. we're on that uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we're still sitting at 3.3 million units that the, that the country needs to have built. And so if they don't do that, the second half of that question is you're still going to continue to see great appreciation happening to existing inventory. So um, there's a little bit of a hiccup. Now just think about it for just a second. How can realtors sell homes if people can't walk through? Well, Dave, they do the videos. I mean, I get all of that. I get all of that. But until we can actually get up and move around and do things, uh, it's gonna be a little bit curtailed. I do believe if the, if the question was in the next two or three months, yes, it will come back. Yes, it will be strong. It will be strong for years to come. Uh, interest rates will continue to come down, making homes more affordable. Incomes will come back. Those people that are still working are actually making more. Look at the census, um, it, uh, you know, uh, Department of Labor, just and anywhere that you look at numbers, uh, people are making more money, can afford it. Uh, for years, the mortgage industry, people were in a very, very good position. And I'm talking like years, not just two or three months, at least three to four years, we're going to be in great shape. Okay. So just like everything, we need to be patient right now. Um, we have some more questions about a non-QM possibly returning and how is that possible? And it's funny because we were just talking about a non-QM lender who's was advertising on Monday that they got a new warehouse line and they have more funding. So is that what you're seeing out there? And if um, you could expound on that, that'd be great. Lenders and not just in California, because sometimes home base is not California for some lenders. So as we're talking to them and we're saying, hey, tell us what's going on. We are hearing back. And uh, I was talking to a lender uh, in another state. I won't say which state. Uh, maybe I can be vague. It's in one of the I states, so a state that begins with the letter <laughs> I. See, that's a little vague. And there's oh okay, that's right. We're coming back next week. And then I actually got an email like about mm, 40 minutes ago from another non-QM lender. But in looking at it, it really looks like they're generating conforming, regular high um, FICO score, tighter LTV. I'm sitting there thinking what makes you a non-QM lender. So what it looks like, it'll look like vanilla when it first comes out. And again, it's gonna be months. It's gonna be after we get a, a cure to the uh, coronavirus. If After we get the vaccine, then you're gonna start to see the real normal. Um, but um, 
but it, it'll just be interesting and you guys will see it so before we get on the next time you're already going to start to see non-qm lenders come back and it'll look very much vanilla well hmm okay i'll reserve my comments on that um if you are a lender or somebody who is doing a loan right now go to our website and post it there's a there is a forum on the main page where you can say what your company is doing um it's like the opposite of the implodometer so go and tell us where what your company can do if you're still doing bank statement loans if you're still doing anything that's outside of the fannie freddie vanilla box let us know everyone Absolutely. wants to know we all want to know use Absolutely. our facebook page we would love to be the resource for people to um see what is happening out there um the beacon of positive how do i get my stuff done in this so, um, yeah, that's great. All right. So what is next? What is your opinion on the unemployment rate after Thursday's job is claimed? Okay, we're writing this down because we're going to check on it next week and see how you do. What's our unemployment rate uh, this Thursday? Continue to go up. Uh, again, remember, these are, not, these are not permanent numbers. So they're going right. to go up. Just, just think about it. When we can start to go out to a restaurant, when we can start to do certain things, and we're not going to be at the ball field or the or the football field or the hockey stadium. I mean, guys, that's just not going to happen first thing out of the shoot. But as we start to come out of our shelter in place orders, our stay at home orders, um, those businesses are going to need to rehire their people. So I absolutely agree with what Barry said. It's not going to be a V or a U. And so let me let me just show you what that means. So V is here, here we are. And now we have all of these people become unemployed. And now we have all other people get rehired. It's not going to be like that. And it's not going to be like a U either. OK, it's going to take time. Uh, going back to your statement, Madam President, of us being patient. It's going to take time, and um, wow, I mean, when I watch the farmers plow the corn and the green beans, and it's breaking my heart. I'm a, I understand it. I get it. Plow everything back in. Those things don't grow overnight. This economy is not going to regrow overnight, and unemployment won't just all of a sudden be you know, back to where it was before. It will come back. People will be rehired will come out of this, but it will be a process. It will take time. Unemployment figures will, figures will be higher. Again. Absolutely. You're not gonna give us a number? Come on, give us a number. Come on. I'm just messing with you, you don't have to. Number. <laughs> um, it's probably gonna be somewhere around uh, four and a half million. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. You're giving us that number. All right, great. Four That'll work. Million unemployed added to what we already have. It's it's Gotcha. We're starting to see it, but it, it, it's 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 not there yet. It's not. You've I had people I, it's, hold on, you know, and they're just kind of at the end of the rope. Is this too little, too late with the checks? Is it for SBA those people trying to hold off and keep all their employees? I mean, is it too little, too late? I don't think it's going to be as high as six. Uh, it will be higher than three, and so that's why I'm saying about four and a half. I know. I know it's hard to know exactly. And it's heartbreaking when they come out. You just ugh, die a little you on the inside. To, but it will come back. That that want to help. And so they're saying, okay, here's our state website, you know, here's the bank's website. And the thing is, they're just inundated. They can't help you. And because they yeah. can't help you, I think some I, I think we're getting some people through the system. Cool. But there's people that couldn't even get into the system before. Right. Like, right. You know, like in the mortgage where we have trailing documents, here we have trailing unemployment that hasn't caught up or been reported yet. Right. No, absolutely. Um, okay, here's another just a detour into a completely different subject. So cash out loans are still requiring physical inspections on the appraisal. What do you suppose the possibility of doing FaceTime appraisals from curbside? For cash out loans might be do you think that they're going to get creative on any of that or are we going to be I, stuck with well, i hope they get creative i mean you know you have an i i've talked to some people in the appraisal industry i think um don't you have um 
uh, people coming up in, in, you know, speaking on that that are much more uh, knowledgeable than I am. But you have this appraiser that just uh, ate something and's got a little tickle in his or her throat. Knock on the door. The people are anxiously waiting for the appraiser who's got his, his mask on and everything. And uh, when the appraiser gets to the door, <coughs> do you think that family's going to let this person in? No, they're not. No. No, they're not. No. And so if a super, super smart state like California hasn't figured out Ron yet, the remote online notary, if they haven't figured that out yet, we still have some concerns. And I know that we're trying to, going back to the construction with the appraisal and putting those together, a new construction. Um, I mean, if, if, if Fannie or Freddie has already done the appraisal and they've done one out of five, one out of every six appraisals on every home on your street, one out of five, one out of six gives them a really, really, really good feel. But what if your street is all brand new houses and they have no genealogy or value or past appraisal or anything like that? Yeah, I, FaceTime, Skype. Yeah, I don't think so. Yep. So does. somebody's asking, what happened to the rebates on loans? and Do you think they will come back to normal? Rebates are part of pricing, and so you should start to see that again probably by midsummer. So I'm thinking that that's why I'm telling you that your third and fourth quarters are going to be pretty good. Uh, okay, so let's say if April 30th we have this uh, lift, the national lift. Okay, everybody can come out. It's still not overnight going to change. So um, I'm saying in May. We're still gonna go through this. It isn't until mid, late June that we're starting to see pricing come back. They've gotta fix the Fannie Freddie problem first. So if you're looking at, well, obviously not today or yesterday because you know rates kind of went up a little bit. But if you're looking at the trend, it, it's, it's much more flat than it was during the, the crazy, you know, uh, second and third week of uh, March. Right. So, oh, good Lord. Here's a good one. So Quicken announced that they're not going to require brokers to pay back commissions on any loan seeking forbearance after they close. And I have the same question. So how is it that they're able to do this and these other lenders are not? Is that, do they have a deal with Fannie and Freddie? Like what, how are they able to do that? Okay. All right. Keep it in English, Dave. All right. So you have a whole bunch of, of smaller lenders and all those smaller lenders don't have the power of say a Wells Fargo and specifically a Quicken. Um, and so these smaller lenders uh, are not as big as like a UWM or something. Okay. A B of A, City, Chase, whatever. And so what they're going to do is they're going to they're all going to get together with what's called an aggregator. So if you look at PennyMac, PennyMac is the largest aggregator in the nation. All of these little people, uh, smaller, you know, uh, lenders, seller, servicers, all get together, and it looks like it's a much bigger lender. Okay, so PennyMac is the one that's come back and said if they've gone on in forbearance, we're not going to buy it. If it's you know, within 15 days of you selling it to us, we're going to make you buy it back. And so you have that scenario. And then you have a big lender like a like a UWM that says, we're not going to lay off anybody. I'm going to sleep on their couch before I lay them off. So when you have like a quick in or, a, or, or somebody like that, that says, OK, you know, we're not relying on an aggregator this is just us this is our money we're the portfolio lender or maybe we have lines but we have enough dollars to back it up that's why you're not seeing those kind of statements from the really 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 big companies did i do that okay you so you could understand well that? yeah except that quicken's the only one that i've heard actually say that they're not going to do the chargebacks and and I, and so if you're selling direct to Fannie Freddie, then you can pull this off. Is that it? And then if you're going to an aggregator like Penny Mac, then you're subject to their overlays. Is correct. that fair? That is that okay. Is okay. What if you're not selling because I haven't. What if you're just keeping it? What if you're just servicing? Right, that's fine too. 
Yeah, right. and you, yes. Yep, got it. Then you don't so, have to but again, have you, because it's, because you're have so you heard of other, have you actually heard other lenders other than Quicken state specifically that they're not? I haven't either. So I think that's interesting. Okay, yep. moving on. Um, So once this is all said and done, if somebody, are lenders going to look at whether someone did an SBA disaster or PPP loan? And is that going to count adversely towards your borrowers in the future? Like it would if they had done a forbearance or a disaster or a deferment. Okay, Sorry. So, so stop, stop, stop. So the PPP is for small business folks. Mm -hmm. so if the borrower is a small business that applied for and received, okay, um, how would the lender know? So to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't show up on a credit report, doesn't show up on an appraisal, doesn't show up on a tax return. It, it just it just doesn't show up anywhere for them to know, right? Um, and what are they well, trying we did to do? Well, we did an problem. SBA webinar last week, and one of the questions was, well, there be well there need to be a personal guarantee on those loans, and the answer was probably. So if you're personally guaranteeing something, then per, potentially it's on your credit report, so they would know. So at that point, and I, maybe the jury's out, and we don't know. It's too soon to tell whether that would count adversely against you. But I think it's a good question. Oh, I do too. SBA has always been built on personal guarantees. That's all been built on personal guarantees. So let's just follow that. Let's just say it is a personal guarantee that does show up on your credit report, but you're just paying it on time as agreed. It's like any other credit card, debt, bill, loan, or anything else. And if it's forgiven, it comes off of the credit report and it's it's closed. It's done. Right. There's no payment required. So right. I really don't I I I, it, I don't see that it's gonna hurt unless they applied for it and didn't need it they applied for it and it wasn't forgiven and they didn't pay it back and so they may be making payments which would increase their dti or they lied got it never paid it back never forgiven and now it counts as a negative mark yeah i can mm -hmm. see that that would be a problem mm -hmm. so let's say that somebody gets a forbearance or a deferment and the question is, how long do you think the waiting period might be before they would be eligible to refinance or purchase? 12 months, 24 months, some infinite period of time that we can't think about? Well, think about government and, and conventional today. Remember a couple of years ago when we had short sales, when we had foreclosures, when we had bankruptcies, when we have all of these kinds of things. Each one of the different um, types of loans, government or conventional, have different waiting periods where I, I see that the FHA, the government ones <clears throat> will have a shorter waiting period, somewhere between 12 to 24 months because pretty much anything older than 24 months is ancient history. However, on the conventional side, they may, big question mark, may have a longer wait period, but I would probably say 24 months before everything is not only forgiven, but forgotten as well. Yeah, it may be, end up being like it happened after the meltdown where eventually they came out with, okay, you have to have this long after a short sale and this long after a, you know, whatever. So, yeah. Right. Um, so th there is a question about FHA loans and the same sort of thing. So are they also saying that there is no, um, that you, if you're in forbearance, then you can't get an FHA loan as well? That's, that's, it's, it okay. FHA is the ultimate buyer of these, HUD is the ultimate buyer of these things. And so um, the lender, they'll have their own individual overlay. They're kind of saying, nah, we're just a little nervous. And so I'm, I'm kind of thinking that FHA, though they're more forgiving, will probably at this point say, no, we don't want to do it, or we're going to wait for a while. It, it's, it, it, we don't have our new normal yet. It's still- We do very, not. Very fluid right now that's why we're doing these weekly because things change that often exactly it's, how many pages did you say you had today seven I have seven, seven pages of notes of all the changes crazy yes yes um, 
Okay, so here's totally one, and see if you can. These seven are totally different from what we talked about last week. Exactly. Okay, how about this? Can you explain how mortgage REITs influence the market? Do that in 20 seconds or less, David Luna. Wow, have REITs been beat up? I, I mean, if, if you're watching, you know, the, the market for REITs, it was like they got to the edge of a cliff and then just boom. I mean, it just, it wasn't sort of a gradual, it was like, boom, it's like it fell off the edge of the cliff. So a REIT, a real estate investment trust is another investment, okay? So if you are investing in Disney, in Delta, in Marriott, American Express, whatever, you're feeling pretty comfortable. Now, if something were to happen, I mean, there's Legionnaire's disease at the hotel, uh, Disney ride started crashing and people were dying. Oh my goodness, you would think, I'm out of this. I, I'm just out of this. That's what happened with REITs. Because we didn't know pricing, because we couldn't anticipate what these you know, blue or red fidget spinners were worth, uh, you had people that were just extremely nervous, and that's why it just fell off the edge of a cliff. It was, uh, it was bad. Will they come back? All investments cycle through. Is real estate still a good investment? Yes. Will it come back? Will the stock market come back? Guys, you're seeing it, what, a week ago at 19,000? And what was it yesterday? 23.3? So will it come back? Yes. How much, how fast? Man, if I knew that, we wouldn't be doing these free webinars. Yeah. So again, um, we've talked about this at length, but just it says that they asked last week and they're still wondering if the credit reports will see um, current on payments, what will be the forbearance be noted? And actually yeah. someone had a follow-up question. Yeah. yeah, it'll be current. Forbearance will not be noted, but just like, just like um, we see that payment history, the lender is going to go back to look at the payment history. Now, what happens is you have ones yeah. every month that shows that a payment was right. made that. So if we look at um, April, May, June, and there's there's not a one there, it's it's not rocket science where you're saying, oh, look, there was no payment made. So if there's no payment. Exactly. Made, they're going to know. Will it be noted forbearance? No. Noted deferral? No. Uh, late. If they were late before the forbearance uh, went in, yes, it will continue to report late. But if they were current, no, it's not going to show. But but lenders are sitting there thinking, wait a minute, I can look at payment history and see if a payment was made. The mark, the right. Payment I mean, how current, it just won't show a payment, and that's how lenders will figure it out. That's what lenders right. are telling how right now. How many times does an underwriter say, get us a credit supplement that shows that your payment was made this month? I mean, hello. I, yeah. So. Protect themselves. Um, can't blame them. They're going to protect themselves. Here's a question. Well, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of what the intent was behind. We're not going to report it to the credit bureaus, right? So, right. but you have to figure they're going to do it in random around this at some point. So we'll see how that works out. Um, are lenders lending on multifamily units over four units, so commercial um, five units or greater? All, all of them are affected, but the changes that happened even to Jenny, and people may not know that Jenny actually does multifamily, meaning five units or more. There is an yep. outlet for those. Um, and as, as soon as we see an outlet for any kind of a loan, that, that's good. As long as it doesn't have to stay on the books and money is being returned to the lender, the lender's gonna lend it out because they're trying to make money and meet payroll and everything else. So as long as there's an outlet, yes, things will happen. If there is no outlet and things are shut down, it depends on the lender that you're talking to. Are they using their own money? Is it a bank that has you know, depositors money at, at some fractional tiny amount that they have to pay out on? And then they're lending it out and they're making money on it and they feel pretty good about the LTV and the Dun and Bradstreet as opposed to regular normal FICO score. I mean, if, if the people are jumping through the hoops and, and all the hoops that the guys, you know, I'm buying a new house. So they're looking at how much down do I still have a job? Uh, what were my savings? I mean, they're just they're just doing their regular lender due diligence. And as long as they're doing the due diligence and I meet all their requirements, yes, I think in 
I think it's eight days now. In eight days now, I'm moving into my brand new house. So that's how it's going to work on the commercial side as well. That's amazing that you're doing all that in the middle of this. It just goes to show you that real estate is not at a screeching halt. Transactions are still happening. I have realtors in my neighborhood who are getting multiple offers on properties right now. It's in, it, there is still business. Oh and yes. we should not be sitting at home twiddling our thumbs or lamenting the state of things. We should be working, right? Yes. So um, somebody asked whether they can get a recording of the webinar and the answer is yes. So just email Megan. And also we've been posting them on our website. Um, I would invite again people to go to our website and post if you're if you're doing loans. Um, somebody's asking me whether we can get a copy, you know, get the names of the non-QM lenders who are in business. And Dave, why don't you and I work on that a little bit over the next week, and maybe we can offer well, some guidance as to where to they them. could I go. Did that this morning, I reached out to a very very large non-QM in the past, and I said, "Are you guys still making loans?" So I've already heard back from some, and yep. I won't mention any names, but but I've already heard back from right. some. We're, we're doing this. Uh, so there'll be a familiar non-QM name. It won't necessarily be non-QM that they roll out with, but uh, you'll, you'll recognize the names as well. Well, and I've said this a couple of times where I want to do a non-QM webinar for people, but I wanted the dust to settle a little bit so that we didn't end up having people on who wouldn't be able to stay afloat long enough to close your loan. So I, it sounds like we're getting to the point where perhaps we will be able to hang our hats on some of the people who will still be um, back in business. And um, we'll put that together in the next week or two and so stand by for that. So we're getting towards the end. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners? People, this is just temporary. Patience as you work through this, it's going to be very, very cool, very productive, very profitable uh, for the next little while. You're going to see rates that are fantastic and people wondering, well, why? If you're injecting all of this debt into the economy, uh, debt only does one thing. It brings down interest rates. And so people were asking me, uh, I did another webinar for the state of Hawaii uh, after the webinar we did last week. And one of the questions I thought was brilliant was, Dave, where do you see inflation? Some mm -hmm. things, pricing goes up on some things, housing, okay, but it comes down on others, gas. Uh, there, there, what's happening so far is there enough, there's enough downward pressure on many different things that inflation really is not a concern or worry. So if inflation is not a worry, if real estate is going up, if interest rates are down because of debt and people will be returning back to jobs, that is just a recipe for some very, very productive, profitable, good years moving forward. Um, were we going to go into a recession? People, we were. And it wasn't uh, COVID-19. We were just moving in that direction. But we will make it through this. And once we make this, and you're starting to see other countries, some countries doing stupid stuff. Man, I shouldn't have said that word. Mm -hmm. some, some <laughs> we can talk about that, that are later. Doing, but they shouldn't be doing, and I won't mention names because I said the S word, stupid. But um, <laughs> but I think they're real. other countries are realizing that's really not the route to go. And so I think inflation will stay in check by the Federal Reserve towards their target 2% inflationary rates. So if things really aren't going to, you know, super increase in price other than homes until they get more homes built. So that's why I said construction will still be good. Um, it, it, it's going to look, the future looks really, really good for all of those reasons. Thank you so much again. Um, so just to recap, Friday we have Ginger Bell who will be presenting Creating Your Virtual Marketing Surf Thrival plan. God, I have to really think to put that together. Next Tuesday, we will have you, Mr. Luna, at 11 o'clock. Um, Barry, at the end of that week, May 1st and 2nd, we will be presenting Mortgage Educators 20-hour um, Get Your License, Pre-Licensure with Kevin Casey, President-Elect for Camp, that he'll be teaching that. So stay tuned, people, and let us know what you want to hear about, and we will look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, Dave. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.
All right. And for you Facebook Live people, uh, we just did that webinar for 